Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight as part of Earth Laws Month. My name is Dr. Michelle Maloney. I'm the uh, co-founder <laughs> and convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this wonderful talk this evening by Brendan Mackey and Ian Lowe, and I'll introduce them in the proper way shortly. Uh, before we uh, get going, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the beautiful lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people here in North Brisbane. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and emerging uh, young leaders and elders. I'd like to acknowledge the remarkable civilizational culture uh, that Aboriginal people developed and maintained that has cared for country and cared for each other since time immemorial. I also like to acknowledge the ongoing impacts and legacy of the colonial project of the British Empire. It might seem a bit odd to do that for some folks, uh, but a lot of the work that we do inside the Australian Earth Laws Alliance and in our Indigenous led organisation, sister organisation Future Dreaming, we're really interested in how we build a positive future for all of us together on this beautiful continent. So it's become quite a nice tradition on Zoom. If you, um, as lovely folks in our audience, would like to pop in the chat um, your name and where you are and anything else you want to share tonight, please do so. Um, I'm going to introduce Brendan in a moment. And um, the format for this evening, um, we're looking at the science of the interconnected life on Earth. Um, and it's also about really the story of evolution, what humanity knows right now. Um, Earth Laws Month is um, September. All of September, we have now almost 35 events um, on our beautiful program, which I can pop the web link for the program into the chat in a moment if you're not familiar with what we're up to. Um, nearly all of our events are free, so please do join us. The whole purpose of Earth Laws Month is really to celebrate humanity's relationship with the living world, and in particular to, um, I guess, showcase a lot of the amazing ideas and work and connections um, that work with us here at the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. We rely on wonderful people across many different sectors, from Indigenous knowledge to science, law, economics, education and the arts, to share with us their amazing work and thoughts as part of our long-term work to build and, I guess, I think our official objectives of AILA are to increase the understanding and practical implementation of Earth-centred governance and our networks of amazing people doing their great work mm -hmm. are deeply important to us. And in a lot of ways, that's what Earth Laws Month is all about. So um, I'm going to introduce Brendan now, and then we'll introduce Ian, and we'll have time for questions and discussion. And if you have any questions throughout, please just pop them into the chat. Um, so, uh, Professor Brendan Mackey is the Director of the Climate Action Beacon at Griffith University um, and is, I think, one of Australia's leading thinkers and scientists in both the climate change and forest ecology space. Um, I met Brendan many years ago, I think it was when we first held our very first AILA conference, um, and Brendan's been a really fantastic champion of Earth-centred governance as well as all of his own remarkable work. So without further ado, I might hand over to Brendan. Good evening. How are you, Brendan? I'm I'm very well, thank you, Michelle. So can you confirm you can see me? You can see my yep, PowerPoint. I can see your slides and I can see you with your beautiful tree behind you and your power in your That's right. Yeah. From um a fig from Northern Rivers, a oh, paddock in Northern Rivers. Beautiful. So let me begin by acknowledging the the uh traditional owners on the land I'm speaking to you from. I'm at the southern end of the Gold Coast. So that's the land of the Yungan Bay and Commonberry peoples. And uh, we had a presentation from um, one of the elders who uh, uh, helps Griffith University in its First Nations um, work. And he recommended that whenever we do an acknowledgement of country, we should, you know, say something personal rather than just rattle off the script that's on the Griffith University website. So I'll just pick up on what Michelle said about, about the colonisation project. And uh, I was hearing uh, people this morning on the radio talking about, I think it was the head of, um, you know, people are saying we've got more important things to worry about, such as the, tri uh, um, the uh, um, reconciliation with First Nations, which uh, I think these are very, are very much related. So I think the 
the decolonization of Australia, you know, does relate to the fact that the King of England is now the King of Australia, our head of state and of the and of the and of our um, defence force as well. If you read the Constitution, so yeah, these these matters are all connected, and that brings me to the theme of my talk, which is the interconnectedness of all life on Earth and. I'll put my timer on now, Michelle. So my thirty minutes starts now. <laughs> the uh, and I want to say something about the emergence and interconnection of life on Earth, uh, and put that in in a, in a in a broader context. And uh, if there's time, I'll say something about what this all might mean for Earth-centered governance. But I mean, I only have don't have time to do um, all of that in depth tonight. But now. I'm talking about what I call, you know, the modern scientific method. And, and what do I mean by that? As we know, there's many different epistemologies or ways of gaining knowledge, but I'm talking about a specific one, which has been very dominant in the last hundred years or so. And I've got three eminent modern scientists there. The first one is John Dewey, who um, basically invented the modern kind of methodology of social science. And he defined and he defined modern science as uh, in that it identifies objects based on intellectual construction rather than common sense, and then converts these intellectually constructed objects to data, and then goes on to quantify the relationships between these objects and other phenomena considered to be causal factors. And of course, the scientist below him is Madame Curie, who won three Nobel prizes for her works in chemistry and physics. So the focus of scientific research so defined is on the theories about the causal factors that explain the relationships between intellectually constructed objects and then seeks to identify situations that contest the validity of these theories by experimentation and empirical confirmation. And of course, the third photograph is of Albert Einstein. But often, uh, the experiments take the form of what is called natural experiments rather than manipulated experiments. So Albert Einstein had theories about, um, about gravity and related matters, and he didn't conduct experiments in a laboratory like M Madame Curie. He made predictions about what, what we should see out in the wider universe, which could subsequently be, be, be validated, empirically validated by people getting data about those phenomena. So at the core of this kind of science are really mathematical quantitative models of relationships or processes between these intellectually constructed objects and theories that make predictions about why things happened in the past or how they might behave or respond in the future. So the question I want to this, this is all by way of leading me to this question. Is there a modern scientific theory of life? Well, um, we've got all sorts of scientific theories and I've used this kind of, I've said established scientific theories. They're, they're, they're the ones that have you know, stood the test of time over the last 120 years at least and have been accepted as current state of scientific, modern scientific knowledge about these things. So we have theories about how the universe came to be, that's the science of cosmology. The evolution of life once it's formed, um, biological evolution, and, and of what's now called Earth system science, or these kind of planetary processes um, at a, a, a for, a for Earth, which are really about the interactions between the geosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the, and the ocean in relation to energy and other chemical substances. And, and we have this scientific understanding of how these enabled and support life. And we do have emerging theories of Earth as an as a interconnected system. Um, there is an Earth systems um, science. And we do have this traditional knowledge of Mother Earth. And, and where I want to you know, um, get to at the end is uh, how this compares, if you like, in what it's saying with what modern scientific theory about life and the universe, Earth and the universe are saying. Well, in terms of where, where our universe came from, uh, that, that 
theory was proposed by George Lemaitre in 1927, the, what's now called the Big Bang Theory. Um, and, and after this uh, singularity event, about 400 million, million years after the Big Bang, the first galaxies were born. Uh, and in the billions of years since stars, galaxies and clusters of galaxies has formed and reformed, um, eventually forming our home galaxy, the Milky Way and, and our cosmic home. So how did we get to Earth from, from the Milky Way? Well, this was actually first proposed by Pierre Laplace in 1755. It's called the Solar Nebula Disk Model, which is the solar system is formed from gas and dust orbiting the sun. So the planets formed and all the elements in the planet like Earth came from consolidation of this cosmic dust and the subsequent processes that happened on, on those planets. So we are truly um, children of the children of the universe made of cosmic dust, literally. And of course, this is a this is the, the a graphical representation of the evolution of life on Earth. It took about it took about half a billion years or so, or it took about point about six hundred million years after Earth was formed by that process we just talk about um, for the first life to emerge. Prokaryotes, very simple organisms, single cell organisms that didn't have a have a well a well formed nucleus, um, and that and that was after the heavens stopped raining down um, upon us. The late into the late heavy bombardment, as it was called, and about about three and a, about three point two um, billion years ago, or three thousand two hundred million years ago, um, those prokaryotes started to photosynthesize, and around you know two point two five billion years ago, we started to see an increase in atmospheric oxygen levels. It took till about two billion years ago to get eukaryotes, which have got a nucleus. And then multicellular life began about one and a half billion years ago, and, and so it goes. It took land plants quite a while, um, about 300 million years to, to form, and then bang, everything happened in a rush, mammals and hominids. So all of this, uh, all of this happened on Earth once it had formed. The question is, you know, how? Well, we have a theory of evolution. We all know Charles Darwin uh, invented that, but in parallel, Alfred Russell Wallace, who lived contemporaneously, came up with exactly the same theory of evolution, which in a nutshell is, is I've written there, changes. Evolution is very simply change in the inheritable con characteristics of a population, a biological population, that are expressions of genes passed on from parents to offspring during reproduction. And these different characteristics arise due to mutation, genetic recombination, and other sources of genetic variation during reproduction. And natural selection acting on the genetic variation of population result in some characteristics becoming more or less common in the population. And what's called the evolutionary pressures or really the selection pressures that make some characteristics more or less common change over time, for example, such as changing climatic conditions and there's a very good book I've recommended there, What Evolution Is by Ernst Mayer, which is a good read here. But before we actually got to living organisms, there were actually preconditions and precursors of life, which was actually Earth, Earth, uh, Earth, Earth herself, if you like, in its purely physical form. And the most important of these is actually Earth's magnetic field. Earth has a solid core rotating in a liquid outer core, and this generates a magnetic field called the magnetosphere. You may not have heard of the magnetosphere. That's a visualization on the right. But life on Earth is only possible because of the magnetosphere, because this shields us from deadly solar winds, which would otherwise completely fry us and make life on Earth impossible. So if ever the liquid outer core should freeze or Earth should stop rotating, the magnetic field, the magnetosphere would cease to exist and we'd all die. Uh, so what's extraordinary when you think about it here is that uh, is that this um, all of life that we talk about you know, is is understood to evolve from a single common ancestor, 
and all species are related to all other species through this inherited DNA, including us. So every species has a last common ancestor, an LCA, with every other species, if you travel far enough back in the evolutionary tree. And all forms of life share a, a last universal common ancestor, which likely evolved in the deep sea vents four billion years ago. So humans didn't evolve from apes, but apes and humans have a common ancestor. But all of us evolved back to these deep sea vents, which are really worth spending a minute on, because the chemical preurses of, of biological metabolism were actually born literally from the bowels of Earth. So there's a there's a photograph of a, of a of what's called a black smoker there. So these are hydrothermal vents, the result of seawater percolating down through the fissures and the ocean crust in the vicinity of where tectonic plates kind of overlap. Uh, and the cold seawater is heated by magna and re-emerges to form vents, and which are really hot. That's a photograph I'm wearing there. The, the vents might reach temperatures of over 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Organic metabolism evolved based on the chemicals generated by these mantle crust processes. The, the, our metabolism is based upon the chemicals that are formed by these, by these smokers. So uh, Earth itself actually gen generated what's called the, pre, the chemical precursors of life. And then ecosystems formed on these systems that were completely dependent upon these chemical processes resulting from the interaction of seawater and, and hot magma associated with what essentially are underwater volcanoes, i.e. life used chemical energy, not solar energy via photosynthesis. The first life evolved here at the bottom of the ocean, literally given birth by this interaction between seawater and hot magma, hot magma um, at these extraordinary smoke events. These are like our, our birthing, this is our birth chamber. And, you know, it, it's easy for us to live our lives not thinking about all, all of this, but one way to kind of make it real is, is to think about how much of our genes we share with others, um, how much of our gene do we share with a chimpanzee, how much do we uh, uh, share with a fruit fly, and how much with a, with a bowl of rice. We should have had a little one of those polls that you can do, um, Michelle which we might do if I ever give this talk again. I'll do uh, it next time, Brendan, for sure. Yeah. But let's play the game the way we did last time. Oh, yeah. So, oh, too late. So Because I've forgotten. <laughs> so, well, what people can do. So, look, I've given you the answer to the first one. It's 99%. Okay. So if people can just put in the chat box what percent they, how much, what fr uh, percentage of our gene they think we share with the fruit fly, just put it in the fruit, fruit, fruit box. Don't, don't think about it too much. And then, well, the answer to that is 60%. Now, how much, put in the chat box, how much you think we share with a bowl of rice? Well, with rice, not the bowl. It's 25%, 25%. And that's because we share a common last ancestor and a, and a last universal shared ancestor. But wait, there's more uh, because it hasn't just been a one way trip, if you like, between Earth's physical environment and life's evolution. There's been this constant interreaction. Now, this, you know, this can be understood very simply um, because it's true for us, our species. Every species of bacteria, fungi, plant, and animal must do certain things. We have to take in essential chemical substances or retain them in the necessary concentrations. We have to release waste substances. And also we have to exclude any, any toxic substances we might um, you know, have accidentally consumed. Everyone's got to do that. But at the same time, um, one species waste um, can be toxic to another species. So uh, when confronted with another species waste, what are your choices? Well, you can exclude them, just have some barrier to them. You can evolve so that the chemical substance is no longer poisonous. It can kind of pass through you without doing any harm. Or if you're really smart, you can evolve so that waste is no longer waste, 
but it's food of some kind or it's energy of some kind, central for metabolism. And this is what happened with oxygen. The first photosynthesizing organisms were blue-green algae in the ocean and their waste product was oxygen. And it's them that basically oxygenated um, uh, over time, changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So all the other forms of life around at that time uh, then had to evolve in a highly oxygenated environment. They had to become adapted to oxygen, which was just a waste product for this particular form of bacteria. And this is just a graph from the famous paper, which mapped all of this out in great detail, but it just shows time on the bottom axis and the fraction of the atmosphere, which is oxygen compared to current day, which is one. And it's almost a straight line as life, you know, life, as life evolved, the amount of oxygen increased and the amount of, and all life, most, well, not all life, most life had to evolve to be able to thrive in that increasingly oxygenated environment. Of course, those ecosystems and species that evolved in the black smokers at the bottom of the ocean, it's a completely non-oxygenated environment and they didn't have to worry about it because they're at the bottom of the ocean, but everyone else had to. So it's absolutely true that all forms of life, you know, evolve and continue to persist as part of a co-evolving planetary ecosystem. The blue-green algae up there and the plants did most of the heavy listing in terms of oxygen, but all plants are exchanging these chemical substances and they're all, all organisms are changing the, the, the chemistry of the surrounding environment. So... This is an extraordinary thing. The, the chemical composition of the atmosphere and, and certainly of the soil and, and, and of the ocean is as much a product of life as it is of the physical earth. So once, if you like, um, physical earth gave birth to those smokers and spawned that first ecosystem, life has really been, um, really been a major dominant factor here in earth's environmental condition. But you know, this brings us to another scientific question. Well, okay, it's a co-evolving system, but what kind of system are we talking about? And I say this because when you talk about systems to most people, they think you know of something that's simple, controllable, and predictable, like a car engine, an internal combustion engine. It's simple, controllable, and predictable. We know if it doesn't go wrong, we can diagnose why it's not going right and fix it. If we put our foot on the accelerator or the brake, we know what will happen. But Earth isn't like that. It's what um, um, complexity theory refers to as a complex adaptive system, which has features very different to a, a complicated system. And I've just put a little animation there to give a sense of complexity, if it works. There we go. Uh, well, first of all, a complex adaptive system has emergent properties not predictable from constituent components. It might be stable, it might be resilient, it might have adaptive capacity. And it has this thing called autopoiesis, which is the ability to self-generate and self-perpetuate. And, and I would argue Earth, Earth uh, exhibits autopoiesis because it gave birth to um, uh, it's self-generated life, which has continued to self-perpetuate. It's a it's an autopoetic system, and it's got both top-down and bottom-up processes. The bottom-up processes are the result of the interactions of very large numbers of agents. All the photosynthesizing plants and algae transform the chemistry of the atmosphere, turning it into an oxygenated state. That's a that's a bottom-up process. These systems also have positive reinforcing and negative dampening, dampening feedbacks. As trees grow, they take carbon out of the atmosphere, they remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it for long periods of time, reducing greenhouse gases, and, and it's a cooling effect on the planet. It's a, neg it's a dampening feedback. As the ice melts in the Arctic, reflection is decreased, absorption is increased, and it has a warming feedback. It's a positive reinforcing for fallback for, for, for um, feedback. So this has incredible implications when you think about um, you know the implications of this for human how humans live on the planet. We've kind of been running it like it's a simple 
complicated, um, controllable, predictable system like a car engine, when in reality, it's a complex adaptive system having those characteristics. Uh, and people have been thinking about this for a while. Uh, you know, the first person, as again, in, in the era of modern science, which dates from about this time, uh, it, it was uh, George Hutton, who actually is, is accredited with founding the discipline of geography. Uh, he wrote a famous essay uh, called Theory of Earth, um, which is written in very much 18th century language. This is uh, pre-Darwin, so they still had a kind of religious view of the world. But when we trace the parts of which this terrestrial system is composed and when we view the general connection of those several parts, <clears throat> the whole represents a machine of a particular construction by which it is adapted to a certain end. So he understood Earth to be a system. And he actually proposed at the time that there should not be a separate discipline of geology and biology, that when you looked at Earth, you couldn't really separate the effect on them. And he, he was actually proposing a, a, a discipline of Earth, of Earth studies. Uh, instead, we got geology. And it's an interesting history as to why we got geology and botany and not a discipline of Earth. And it was to do with, um, it was actually to do with colonization. And they wanted disciplines that could find them useful things, useful resources, essentially. They weren't interested in disciplines that could actually understand um, understand things are interested in finding minerals and valuable plants. Anyway, he's kind of the father, if you like, of modern earth theory, I would suggest. But there have been three others. Vladimir Ivanovich Vernatsky um, wrote a book in 1924 called The Biosphere, Life as a Geological Force. Uh, Vernatsky's work, due to all sorts of political reasons, his, his, his science didn't get published until after World War II in the late 1940s. And of course, it, it wasn't, the whole book wasn't translated. There was a series of journal articles and, and it was translated as biogeochemical cycling. So you might have heard of that term biogeochemical cycling, but that was kind of a poor English translation of what he was actually talking about was the biosphere was the fact that Earth uh, cannot, you know, to understand the Earth system, you need to understand the role that life has played as a geological force, as we've been talking about. And Arthur Tansley, of course, invented the uh, concept of the ecosystem, which has really been fundamental to our kind of thinking of Earth as a system. And of course, James Lovelock, who um, had this popularized his Earth system theory through calling it the Gaia theory, where he it, as explained, Earth functions like an organism in, in, in many respects. So we've actually had, you know, uh, a good hundred years now, since 1924 at least, of people, of, of scientists, modern in the modern sense, I've been modern science since I've been talking about, um, trying to trying to come up with um, look at Earth as a as a complex system. Yet we, I would still argue we have actually no theory in terms of I'm, how I'm discussing a modern scientific quantitative theory of how life evolved from non-life. This is very interesting when you think about what we claim to know and not know and what we can do with our technology, um, what we know about the genome and all the terrible things we're doing with genetic engineering. The very fundamental question we, we can't answer um, so we don't have a scientific theory, as I've been talking about them, that enables the prediction of when and where life will emerge. Uh, we can't experimentally create life. People have tried to take those environmental conditions that the smokers created at the bottom of the ocean laboratory and, you know, add all those pre, pre, preconditional chemicals and, and, you know, some lightning and, you know, nothing happens. Right? And we've actually got no evidence of life anywhere else in the universe. And, you know, we accept the scientific theory that the universe began with a singularity, you know, Big Bang. Well, perhaps life began with a, perhaps life in the universe began with a singularity and where it. Most people don't like that idea. It's a very scary idea. Uh, and of course, it, it smacks of, it smacks of, you know, 
um, human centrism. Where the, does this mean we're at the center of the universe? Um, and the universe is so vast, vast that we've seen from those latest amazing um, uh, images of other galaxies and just, you know, this the, the universe is so vast, there's so many galaxies, there's so many suns, there's so many planets. There must be, you know, logically we think there must be thousands and thousands of places where the similar preconditions I've talked about, a magnetic, a planetary magnetic field and, 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 and an ocean where you've got these chemicals that life need, that soup all being cooked up. There must be thousands, millions, if not billions of places in the universe, given how vast it is, where that has, is, and will happen. That may be true, but we have no way of predicting it. Of course, we, we have no theory about how life become, how non-life becomes life. So we, we have no way of saying where else in the universe might, might occur. So for me, it's a cautionary tale. Um, uh, some people say, well, let's not worry about life on this planet because what does it matter what happens to us? Well, it could be it matters a lot. But there is a way out of that uh, dilemma, if you like, and it could be that the difference between what we call the physical and the biological is not such a hard divide. Right? So it could be that this transition between non-life and life isn't actually as a big thing as what we think it is. And people have been thinking about that for some time too. So here's a wonderful um, 17th century, um, um, I'm not sure if she was English or Scottish, I could get in trouble here. Uh, but anyway, Margaret, a philosopher, very well-known philosopher, Margaret Lucas Cavendish, and this is a She's basically arguing this. I perceive man as a great spleen against self-moving corporal nature, although himself is part of her. And the reason is his ambition, for he would fain be superior and above all other creatures as more towards a divine nature. He would, he would be a god if arguments could make him such. So she was arguing in this essay that, well, you know, we not only do we think we're, we're, we're different to all other living organisms, we're just not even part of nature writ large. And then there was this um, amazing, I think, um, physicist and mathematician, Alfred North Whitehead, who was also a, a modern philosopher. And, and he wrote a famous book called Process in Reality, where he was arguing this very explicitly. You know, he argued there is no difference. There is no real hard divine between physical and biological. The problem in our thinking is that what we're calling the physical is actually organic. He argued the whole universe is organic. So he, he, he argued that recognition that the world is organic rather than materialistic is essential for anyone wanting to... I see that my video is framed. Can you... Uh, so recognition that the world is organic rather than materialistic is essential for anyone wanting to develop a comprehensive account of nature. So he just said we're all part of nature. The living, you know, we Just being humans, we, we, we think we're special. The result is that nature is no longer thought to be simply atoms in the void, but instead a structure of evolving processes. The reality is the process. And that's what I've been talking about. It's this process that at least at least a modern scientific, you know, quantitative understanding of that process, starting with the Big Bang and how solar systems formed and how planets formed and, and those planetary processes that were the precursors of life. And then these apo apoetic processes, which which um, you know led to the tree of life. The reality is the process that we're too hung up on this distinction between living and non-living. He yeah, it's all organic. So this brings me to um, you know Mother Earth. Uh, I think my, Mother Earth and modern science uh, scientific theories have a lot in common. Because if you if if you read and think about and talk to people about knowledge holders about the indigenous concept of Mother Earth, I think it's proving to be more than a, a metaphor or cultural contract. It, it kind of maps really well onto modern scientific theories about how life on Earth came to be. I mean, there's obviously metaphor there, if you like, but uh, it's really interesting. I've got a quote there from Kerry Arabina, who is a descendant of the Miriam people from the Torres Strait, and I had the kind of pleasure of being her co-supervisor for her PhD with. Professor Val Plumwood, 
And, and Kerry argued that we are all indigenous to the universe. The universe is moral, the universe is alive, everything is related. She had this interesting idea that space determines the nature of relationships and time determines the meaning of relationships, which is a, a deep thought to ponder, I guess. But again, this is very much aligned with um, what Whitehead was, was saying. You know, we're not just atoms in a void. And there was another, um, so what does that say very quickly, because I'm running out of time rapidly. So, you know, what, what does all of this mean for the human endeavor? What does it mean that this, this, this process, if reality is the process and, and we've, um, you know, we are part of this tree of life, that has, it's part of this earth process. Uh, you know, it, it must have some, what, what does it mean for us and for the human endeavor? I think there are ethical consequences of both modern scientific theories of, of, of cosmology and earth's evolution that we haven't really thought much about. And, and there's implications for our systems of governance. Uh, and there's a great, in, in terms of the ethics uh, of this, Mary Beatrice Midgley is another, recently deceased philosopher, English philosopher, I can recommend, who wrote very powerfully about this very fact. And, you know, here's a quote from her. We are not aliens on a strange planet. Our history and biology, which place us here, ensure that the facts of this planet have plenty of meaning for us. So she argued that this scientific understanding, um, as, as traditional cosmology does for Indigenous people, this scientific understanding should should make us reflect very deeply on what our kind of obligations are here. Uh, some of you who know me, I spent a lot of time um, working with the Earth Charter, which was really into a universal declaration of our, or a declaration of our universal responsibilities um, and the need to identify with the whole Earth community as well as our local communities and the need for a shared vision of basic values to provide an ethical foundation for an emerging world community. Uh, and this, this very much, which I think is consistent with uh, seeing ourselves as being part of um, that reality, which is the process of which we are a part, of which we are still a part. And very quickly, you know, a complex, the, the key message in terms of governance is if Earth is a, a complex adaptive system cannot be controlled, it can kind of be influenced. You can certainly disrupt it, but you can't control it. And I think that's our big mistake when it comes to our governance systems. And the person I always point people to, and maybe we should run a webinar about Donella Meadows um, one day, uh, who, who was the model, who did all the modeling for the Club of Rome report. And it basically, I would argue, invented systems modeling and its application to problems of people and the environment. Uh, and she wrote a wonderful essay called um, Leverage Points in, in, in Leverage, leverage points, places to intervene in a system. And these are all the ways that you can influence a system, a complex adaptive system, mindful of the fact you can't, you can't manage it or determine it, but you can certainly influence. Um, but we'll have to leave that for another day. So here's my final um, comment, Michelle. You know, so this is the challenge for Ayla going forward, you know. What forms of governance are consistent with the scientific and Mother Earth concepts of Earth as a co-evolving co complex adaptive system for which we have moral responsibility? The end. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brendan. Oh, you're moving again, just in time. Okay, Thank that's... you, Brendan. Um, if you are able to turn your screen off, then we'll be able to see you and Ian together. Let me see. Excellent. Brendan, that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons I invited you to be one of our speakers in Earth Laws Month is many, many years ago when I invited you to come and speak at our Earth Jurisprudence course and you gave that, well, a different version of that talk. As a non-scientist, it was really, it kind of blew my hair back. I just really enjoyed that succinct overview of this remarkable living organism we're part of. So thank you, Brendan. And um, I'm now gonna turn to Ian and Ian's gonna give comments or a presentation um, entirely up to Ian. And then um, we'll have a discussion uh, together and take any questions. So thank you again, Brendan, absolutely wonderful. And Mr. Ian Lowe, it's so nice to see you. How are you tonight? 
I'm fine, and I'm about to try and share the screen. Oh, something's happening this time. Woohoo! It's working. Now I just need to go to slideshow. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, if it, if and, it, and Brendan, we'll let you relax under your giant fig tree. We'll see you in <laughs> in a moment. Okay, uh, I'm going to build on uh, what Brendan has so eloquently said and make a few comments about uh, uh, both the science and uh, systems of governance. I also want to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Gubby, Gubby people uh, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. But uh, also, like Brendan, I want to go beyond the usual formal acknowledgement uh, and say something that I think is particularly significant for Earth Laws Month, um, which is that I attended a wonderful session on Indigenous science at the Byron Writers Festival and learned about, uh, for example, uh, how the first Australians worked out how the changing pattern of dark spaces in the sky that looked like an emu changing over the seasons gave them an indication of when the emu's eggs were being laid and they could safely harvest them, when they were being hatched and they needed to look after them and so on. And um, make the point that uh, the Indigenous people, by a process which is identical to that of modern Western science, worked out how to live within the limits of the natural systems of this harsh and unforgiving continent and of significance to this month embodied those knowings, not just in custom and practice, not just in song and dance and ceremony, but in this system of laws. And if we want to live sustainably within the limits of natural systems, we have to find a way of making our legal framework reflect the demands of living sustainably. So I'm gonna say something about science's process and the limits of our knowledge, what we know and what we don't know, uh, the evidence that uh, what we're doing is not working and uh, talk about a, a framework for moving ahead and what that means in terms of governance. And the most fundamental point, I think, is to recognise, as Brendan said, that uh, science is not a body of knowledge, which is the picture you get from school science, but it's a process, a process of constantly refining our knowledge through observation and experiment, through developing theories that explain what we see and then using those theories to further test them against the reality of the world. The only point on which I agree with what are called uh, climate skeptics, who are in fact usually climate deniers, is their comment that the science is not settled. It's an essentially trivial point because science is never settled. Science is always a work in progress and what distinguishes science from organized superstition is that it's open to revision in the light of new evidence or better theories, and that our work before it's published is reviewed by our peers, and if it's of significance, other people will try to confirm it. And that's why we have the science that allows us to see after dark, that allows us to move around, to have potable water and nutritious food and so on. I chaired the advisory council that produced the first national report on the state of the environment 25 years ago. And in it, we said that we had some serious problems that uh, needed to be dealt with immediately in 1996, if we were to achieve our goal of living sustainably. And we said the problems weren't simple. They were the cumulative consequences of the growth and distribution of our population, our lifestyle choices, the technologies we use, and the demands they make on natural resources. Fundamentally, the report pointed out the limits of our knowledge. In the biodiversity chapter, it said more than a million species are thought to live in Australia. Less than 15% have been formally described. Lack of knowledge about the diversity of life and the effect of our activities pose the most significant impediment to its conservation. In that sense, while we know we're losing biodiversity, what we don't know is that we are losing other biodiversity that we do not know about. And to reinforce a point that Brendan made, to talk about environmental management in that sense is indefensible hubris. To draw the parallel, it would be like uh, somebody saying they could manage a football team when they've only met two or three of the players and they have no idea what the others do or how they might fit in with the players that they've recognised, but they just hope it'll all work out. <clears throat> and we are in that sense. Um, 
pulling random bricks out of the, the wall of life without any understanding of what the consequences will be. The 2016 report uh, said that there are areas where the condition of the environment is poor and deteriorating and uh, identified human pressures as the key drivers of environmental change. And the most recent report suppressed by the Morrison government, but now released by Tanya Plibersek, said overall the state and trend of our environment is poor and deteriorating because of increasing pressures. And all of those pressures are directly or indirectly uh, driven by the demands of us as a human population. The report also pointed out that these are not just aesthetic issues, our health, living standards, cultural and spiritual fulfillment, connection to country are all interconnected and are all negatively impacted by our deteriorating environment. So in that sense, it's not just a nice thing to look after our natural environment or our biodiversity, it's critically dependent to us having a fulfilling life. At the global level, there have now been six reports in the series on the global environmental outlook, pointing out that the observed changes to Earth systems are unprecedented in human history, and several critical thresholds are close to or have been exceeded, with the consequence possibly abrupt or irreversible changes to our life support systems. The Stockholm Institute's work on planetary limits shows that we are beyond some of the safe limits and in other areas like land system change or climate change. We're in an area of uncertainty where we just don't know whether what we are doing is doing irreversible damage or not. The world scientists second warning to humanity summarized what we know in nine graphs and pointed out that the one area where we've made significant progress is reducing the release of ozone depleting substances. Um, but freshwater per capita is declining, the fish catch is declining, number of ocean dead zones are increasing. We've lost 100 million hectares of forest in the last 25 years. Vertebrate species abundance is rapidly declining. Carbon dioxide emissions are accelerating as is temperature change. And basically because every year there are more of us and there is more of our livestock. Especially troubling, they said, is the trajectory of potentially catastrophic climate change and the mass extinction event. Many life forms could be annihilated or committed to extinction by the end of this century. That reinforced the Living Planet report, which surveyed 10,000 species, mammals, birds, amphibians, fish and reptiles, and found populations down by more than 50% since 1970. And the Director General of WWF said, heads of state need to start thinking globally, business and consumers need to stop behaving as if we live in a limitless world. This summary in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment pointed out that the, the loss of species in the 20th century, the recent past, is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times the average over the Earth's history from the fossil record. And we know what's causing the loss of species, destruction of habitat, introduced species and chemical pollution, none of which are slowing down, but are now being compounded by climate change. And the gloomy picture is that the rate at which we are losing species this century will be somewhere between in 100 times that of the last century. So we are really facing a quite catastrophic situation uh, that demands action. And uh, when I talk about pulling random bricks out of the wall of life, what we do know is that when a species goes extinct, there are implications up and down the food chain. There are implications for the species on which it predated, implications for the species for which it was a food source. But because of our limited understanding of where those species are and how they interact, uh, we are basically like a small child pulling random components out of the back of a TV set without knowing when the whole system is going to stop working. In, in a sense, uh, we decided as a polity 30 years ago that we wouldn't behave in this unprincipled and irresponsible way when COAG meeting in Simulated Majesty in Canberra adopted a national strategy for ecologically sustainable development and committed all our governments in principle to a path of economic progress that doesn't impair the welfare of future generations, that strives for equity within and between generations, recognises the global dimension of what we're doing, protects our biological diversity and maintains ecological processes and systems. 
I leave you to ponder on the extent to which recent governments at any level show any sign even of knowing there is a national strategy for sustainability, let alone seeing that as a way in which we should act. The fundamental drivers of our destruction of natural systems is our increasing population, increasing consumption per person, and the societal values that see that as desirable rather than a problem. The framework we need to have if we're going to live within the limits of natural systems is one that doesn't see the economy as the be all and end all, that recognizes that it's a subset of human society, only a subset, and a society is totally enclosed within and totally dependent upon natural ecological systems. We are as dependent on natural systems, both for our sustenance and the processing of our waste, as gum trees or galahs or goannas or garfish. Um, and uh, that's a fundamental point that we need to, to recognize. In terms of governance, the only comment I'd make is that our predominantly national forms of governance clearly cannot cope with the problems we now face. Global problems require global solutions. And um, to point the finger at ourselves, if uh, the human species is to survive in any recognizable form, wasteful consumption in the minority world and obscene levels of military spending must be drastically reduced. I think the fundamental problem is that uh, there's no sign of recognizing at a government level, the scale of change needed to have a sustainable future. So to conclude, uh, it's implicit in what I've been saying that our decisions are shaping the future. And I believe we should be trying to produce a sustainable future. We're certainly not currently heading in that direction. We are doing irreparable damage to the natural systems on which we depend. And the development of the idea of sustainability science is that our, both our gathering of knowledge and our application of it should be predicated on that fundamental responsibility of living within the observable limits of natural systems and recognizing the extent to which we need to change. That's fundamentally our responsibility to the other species that we share this planet with and to the future generations for whom we hold it in trust. Because there is no planet B this earth is the only home we have, the only home we will ever have. There's no realistic prospect of mass migration to another part of the cosmos or rescue by friendly aliens. We are deciding whether we will live within the limits of natural systems or as it was summarized by my little granddaughter at one of the school children's climate uh, change demonstrations, we need to care for our world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. I'm now going to bring Brendan back if he's still there. He might be having dinner. <laughs> I know I'm, my dinner's calling me. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that have come through to me privately. They're not in the chat. Um, one's actually about the recent web telescope, but we might come back to that one. Um, just so that we can have a, a bit of a discussion about the material you've just shared with us. Can I ask your opinions, perhaps firstly you, Brendan, and then you, Ian, given what science and Indigenous people what science has known for many hundreds of years and what Indigenous people have known since time immemorial of the preciousness and interconnectedness of life. A lot of the work that we do inside AILA is helping folks who are non-Indigenous understand the kind of the history of why particularly Eurocentric thinking and practice and work has brought us to a place where we use resources and have done for some time rather terribly and unsustainably. But I'd love your thoughts as scientists in Australia, why do you think, beyond just the money thing, culturally, why don't we have a culture yet that has embraced country, embraced the living world, understood all these things? Why are we, as Thomas Berry would say, so happy to be disconnected from the rest of the living world? Brendan, your thoughts. Well, I, I think... That's, a, I mean, well, that is a good question. And I, I don't really, I, I, th I think the answers to that lay in social psychology and personal psychology. I think there is something about people wanting to be secure. And I think one of the reasons why people have more resources than what they need is that they don't know how much they need. And they, and, and, and the more we the more we live in a society where it's atomized and 
and we don't feel secure. We're not we're not secured, but we're not in a supporting society or supporting community, a kind of an atomized society. People feel they need more to buffer themselves against those uncertainties. I, I think I think there are aspects of kind of social and personal psychology at play. But I mean, fun, you know, fundamentally, this has been um, the the you know the uh, globalization has been going on for a very long time, right? You know, it's um, it, it, it you know you you Europe Europe the European countries, you know. Uh, you know, work, worked out it was easier to um, colonize other countries and exploit their resources than, 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 uh, you know, that, than to restrict their own use. That was a very, own. that was a very effective way of growing. Was I mean, yeah. you know, colonization was a, was basically about um, invading and occupying and exploiting other countries' natural resources. So you know, in a sense. You can point the finger at the at, at how the capitalist system has evolved. In a sense, they've colonized the whole planet. I mean, in a sense, the climate change problem is kind of the environmental consequence of everything being being colonized in terms of everything being um, you know exploited for that to to feed that machine. Except, of course, it's not just European countries anymore. You know, not anymore. No. There's every every national economy has got has got that same kind of disease. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a social scientist. I don't know if I can say much much more than that. No, I think that's helpful. Thank you, Brendan. And Ian, <laughs> what's your thinking after so many decades working? I mean, uh, well, I was going to say, even your initial slide talking about the 1996, you know, uh, state of the environment, and I started working in. I'm younger than you, but it's still bizarre because in 1995 I started working with the first uh, agency set up in Australia to address climate change in 1995 and if it had been allowed to continue doing its good deeds I think we and had continued to spread across anyway I think we've been a very different place Ian what are your thoughts on you know how we got here socially and then I'm going to turn it around and say what can science you know how can we continue to strengthen science in our community particularly now we've had a change in federal government that might be more open to that. Yeah, I mean, I think Brendan's right to point the finger at uh, European colonialism because Europe, uh, as they toured the world, um, putting a flag into anything that didn't move and a gun barrel into anything that did, um, they didn't just go there and uh, expropriate the resources. They imported to those countries the European way of thinking based on the Abrahamic religions that saw us as the summit of creation in the centre of the universe and all living creatures at our disposal. And um, the, uh, the, the Enlightenment and the, uh, the, the revolution in thinking uh, was all about applying science, applying knowledge uh, to fashion the world to meet our needs. And there was very little understanding of the interconnectedness of life, whereas the original Australians were here for tens of thousands of years, learning about the interconnectedness of life. And uh, as they say, the land doesn't belong to us, we belong to the land, that uh, we are an integral part of the ecological system. And they learned that painfully over, over tens of thousands of years. So uh, I was involved in the discussions that led to the publication of a paper on so-called sustainability science. And that was about uh, saying that we uh, shouldn't persist in atomistic science, you know, looking at, at parts of the problem. We need to recognize that it's a complex adaptive system. As Brendan said, we can't manage that system, we can't control it, but we can perturb it. And so what we need to be doing in seeking to find a way forward that uh, is genuinely sustainable is uh, what are effectively controlled experiments in which we change the way we grow our food, we change the way we manage our waste, and we observe how the natural systems respond to that perturbation and try to move towards uh, approaches that would at least in principle be able to be continued rather than ones which are uh, probably as the limits to growth modeling suggested, uh, likely to lead to the collapse of civilization. 
Thank I, you. Would just, I would just add to that, Michelle, that I, you know, the, <clears throat> I agree with what Ian said. And the reason why, one of the reasons I mentioned George Hutton, right, is he, in, in that period of the 1780s, 1790s, the British Academy, what, what, they were literally debating what sign, what disciplines would be formed mm. and supported by the Academy. Yeah. And George Hutton said, if we really want to understand Earth, what's going on, in terms of the biophysical world, we should not have a discipline of geology, discipline of biology, we should have a discipline of Earth, because it's all interconnected. Mm. You know, he said, look at the earth, you see by you see the footprint of biology everywhere, right? So now now he 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 was then made found he was in, they then founded the discipline of geology, made him the first head of the discipline of geology, maybe as punishment. But uh, but why did they do that? Well, that was when they started to run around exploiting the world's resources. Yep. And then on a discipline of geology to show them to discover useful minerals. And they wanted a discipline of botany for two for two reasons. One is find plants they could breed up for, for commercial use or a decorative use for gardens. They were the two. So the that that's when the botanic gardens got formed, right? It was for the purposes of breeding up useful plants, either for agriculture or for or for you know decorative purposes. And and the, and, and and the discipline of geology was purely so they could send. So the people who went out on these, um, you know, uh, uh, like Joseph Banks, you know, Joseph Banks might have been there because he was he loved plants and was generally interested in, in the ecology, but he was there to find out what was, you know, what was useful. So it's the difference between, you know, science for knowledge sake, and if you like, science for, for, for human use sake, and of course, increasingly we've had science for technology's sake, right? So science. Most the overwhelming majority of science isn't about trying to understand the world, understand reality, understand nature, how how things work. You know, it's about producing useful stuff, right? So I I, I don't have the statistics right, but overwhelmingly most you know re research funds go into medical mm -hmm. research, not to make people healthy, but you know for stuff people can sell uh, or it goes to military use to find better ways of killing people yes. so well and and on that note brendan science is actually about knowledge for the sake of better understanding that actually answers my original question i was going to say that um i was when i did my phd on regulating unsustainable consumption and i looked across the history of mass consumer consumption um, there's something like 70% of the world's psychologists are actually employed in marketing, not making people better, uh, creating dissatisfaction and developing ways for them to buy stuff, which links really nicely to our next question. Uh, Walter's asked, where's a good place to start dismantling the notion that technology will always save us? And again, this is a bit of a psychological question, but I would love your thoughts. And I promise we'll come back to science. Well, the, the point about technology is... Um, basing it on what Brendan has so eloquently explained, you, you can never change only one thing in a complex adaptive system. So every technology that's implemented to solve a problem inevitably creates a new series of problems. Um, you know, the technology that was invented to uh, cope with the exhaustion of forests, the harvesting of uh, fossil fuels, uh, has in turn created the problem of climate change. And any of the solutions to the problem of climate change have environmental issues as well. And the, the fundamental thing that we need to learn is that we need to use the natural resources much more efficiently. There was a, a study done by the UN about uh, resources and economic development of the Asia Pacific region that concluded that the only way, even in principle, of meeting the legitimate material expectations of the population of this region, the Asia Pacific, within the limits of natural systems, is to have a new industrial revolution in which we meet our needs using 20 to 25% of the per capita resources we now use. And, um, there's really no concerted research program aimed at that new industrial revolution. Now, as uh, Brendan has said, you know, most of the research uh, around the world is 
medical research to cope with the casualties of unhealthy living, military research to find better ways of killing people, um, or research to cope with the problems created by the solutions to yesterday's problems. And we really need to move beyond that and start thinking about what is the research we need uh, if we're going to have uh, a better life for, for all humans on Earth. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, there's a really good question here from Janet. Um, and before I pose her question, I guess for anyone who's joining us and hasn't been part of any of Ayla's work or Brendan's or Ian's, um, before we get the question about, you know, where are the Indigenous people in this conversation, please note that we're having 35 conversations throughout Earth Laws Month in September, um, and many of them include Indigenous friends and colleagues, and also myself, I work with Mary Graham and Ross Williams in um, Future Dreaming, and we explore a lot of these issues together, not the science stuff, but the colonising, decolonising, relationist ethos, so if you want more of that, uh, please just look up Ayla Future Dreaming. I'll put some notes in there because we absolutely all respect the fact that Indigenous cultures worked out a lot of their stuff way before Europeans did. Um, and Western science has some aspects of usefulness, but not all. And leading to that then, um, Janet's question, um, how many non-Indigenous scientists do you think um, would think or acknowledge that Indigenous peoples have science. Uh, I think a lot of non-Indigenous scientists, a uh, lot, sorry, <laughs> it must be late at night. Um, I think a lot of non-Indigenous scientists do not know about Indigenous science. And I'm speaking from personal experience as a non-Indigenous scientist um, due to my interactions with others in my community. And then a number of other folks commented on Indigenous astronomy projects and many other Indigenous science issues. But Brendan and Ian, as scientists, do you think this is something that other scientists feel um, they understand? No, well, I think, uh, no, after you, Brendan. Vehement responses there. You go, Brendan, no, then you Ian. Look, the, I was very specific because I talked about, you know, modern a, a particular modern scientific methodology, right? So this is the key thing to understand. There, you know, um, there are there are different scientific methodologies, right? Um, so, and we're talking about epistemology, right? Where different epistemologies, how do we acquire epistemology is in how do we acquire knowledge? So there are different epistemologies, there are different ways of acquiring different different kinds of knowledge. And and I was talking about the one which is which which is based upon um, theories about about causality and and, and mathematical, mathematical representation of these intellectualized objects and then making predictions which are then empirically tested. But, there, you know, and, and that's one particular form of science, which is really powerful, particularly when it comes to um, uh, building technology. And, and I'll just quickly give an example of that, which is energy. We all know what energy is, right? We know there's different kinds of energy. There's solar energy, there's heat energy, there's electricity, there's, there's nuclear energy, there's um, electromagnetic energy, there's gravitational energy. Well, if you ask a physicist what an energy uh, what, what energy is, they'll, they'll say we don't know. Of course, and you say, well, what, is, what do you mean you don't know? And they say, well, all we have are mathematical equations which which describe what this stuff does in different situations, and it enables us to predict really accurately what will what will happen to it or what we'll do if we do certain things or if it's in a particular context. And as to what it is, well, we don't we don't know, we don't care, because that's they call that metaphysics. So it, you know, this is what you've got to understand that that reductionist quantitative science is is not interested in. Is not interested in understanding why something is. It's just, you know, is it, it does do these quite does this math does the theory and the mathematics we use to to model that phenomenon is it sufficiently useful for the purposes we want? Right. So it it comes down to its util it, it really comes down to its utilitarian value, and the physics of energy. I mean, you know, it, it, they, 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 they don't know what this stuff is. Um, like the classic definition of, um, of, you know, if you're talking about Earth's climate 
and, and about the greenhouse effect, you start by saying, well, energy comes to Earth from the sun in packets of energy we call photons. Well, that's just saying energy is energy. That's, it doesn't say what it is. You ask a physicist what it is, he gives you what he or she gives you an equation. Okay, so, so when we talk about science, we've got to say what kind of scientific knowledge are we talking about? Because not, there's many different kinds of scientific knowledge. Uh, I think what makes something scientific from non-scientific is is that as Ian said, it's a it's a systematic, um, open-ended inquiry, that's uh, where where your understanding of the phenomenon is amenable to changing based upon new new data and new information. Um, I mean, Einstein never conducted an experiment in his life. He just had all these equations which said, well, if someone can, you know, if someone invents a telescope that one day can see this. Thing happening somewhere in the universe. It, this is this is what my equations say it should be. I mean, that's all he did. So, so absolutely, you know. I mean, tradition. You know, people who are hunter gatherers or people who are traditional farmers, they are very systematic in how they acquired knowledge because their survival depended upon it. You know, their flourishing depended upon it. So they, you know, they they had very deep knowledge and it was systematically gained. But, um, you know, they they were they didn't necessarily had mathematical models, and there was a certain level at which they didn't need to understand the processes in terms of what, oh, it's the same thing, they were pragmatic. They needed to understand enough so that it worked in order for what they needed to do. So, yeah, I, I think in answer to your question, most, most the reason why most scientists don't look at indigenous science as science is because they graduate from university Never, never having done one single unit in the philosophy of science and don't know the meaning of the word epistemology, right? So they're just poorly educated. You know, I, I would like to see every, you know, as every every science degree should have a, at least one compulsory unit in the philosophy of science, the history of science, and and epistemology, because then we wouldn't get this kind of nonsense that you know, that that Aboriginal people could somehow. Um, thrive on this continent for 60,000 years without having a systematic way of what they were just lucky. I mean, it's nonsense. To... <laughs> Can I just say, I think that the same call for the legal profession, economics, everything across Western so-called disciplines need the philosophy. But anyway, that's, um, oh, Ian, do you have any thoughts from, thank you, Brendan. Ian, do you have any thoughts from your own perspectives about how, what other non-Indigenous scientists may or may not know about Indigenous science? Well, I think generally there's a cosmic ignorance uh, among Western scientists. I mean, I am a culpa. I, I spent most of my professional life totally ignorant about the even the concept of Indigenous science. I mean, I was about 20 before I ever met uh, an Indigenous person in Australia. Uh, and uh, I certainly in my formal education uh, learned nothing at all about um, the idea of indigenous science, or um, uh, you know, we were basically taught in history that uh, these primitive people had been civilized by uh, the, the coming of European explorers and uh, the, uh, the the British Empire. And um, uh, I, I think the the other point Brendan makes is one I, I totally support. In fact, when Griffith University started in the 1970s, the fundamental point of their science degree was that students studied science in its social and political and philosophical context. A subject called science, technology and society was a quarter of the first year program, compulsory for all science students. And it covered the philosophy of science, the social structure of the scientific community, the application of science and technology and economic development, the possible role of science and technology in the future. And that was a fundamental part of the Griffith science degree for the first 20 years or so of uh, Griffith University, it's gradually been phased out. And um, now it's again possible for people to acquire the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the sciences while making logical errors that would see you laugh yeah. out of a first year arts tutorial in philosophy. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a fundamental point that uh, if people are going to practice science, they should understand the structure of scientific knowledge. Uh, basic of their profession. Excellent. Sorry, I wasn't sure if Brendan was going to comment, but yes, that's fantastic. Thank I was you. nodding my head in. 
Hmm. Nodding right. emphatically, yes. Got uh, one more question and several comments. Um, Hamed, lovely to see you online. Hamed has asked, oh, some other comment. Uh, I wonder what our scientists here think of the possibility for integrating the spiritual accounts of nature that assign purpose to life in the universe and the mainstream modern science. Um, could theories like, uh, could theories like, I might leave that last part, but yeah. So what do you think about integrating the spiritual accounts of nature and mainstream modern science? Well, I think we have to if we're going to survive. I mean, you, we can't go on pretending that human society exists in a biological vacuum um, because we depend critically on the natural resources of the planet and we depend critically on maintaining the natural systems of the planet to process our wastes and uh, accommodate our needs. So uh, unless we embrace that wider view, um, we certainly have no future as a civilization. I'm not even sure we have a future as a species uh, unless we embrace that spiritual view of recognizing our connectedness mm -hmm. to all forms of life. Um, that's, that's so fundamental, I think, that. Uh, you know, I don't think you can overstate the importance of recognizing the interconnectedness of life, because uh, unless we recognize that, uh, we we are doomed. Well, that is a perfect comment for tonight's session. And one of the reasons I was so excited to bring Brendan and Ian's knowledge into our space this month is that interconnectedness of life is the essence of all things. And if we can't structure ourselves as human beings to understand, appreciate and support that, then yes, we are doomed. Brendan, what, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, I I would argue that, or, or suggest, I guess, that, you know, spirituality is fundamental to, to, to our species. I mean, you know, if if we accept this, um, this um, scientific perspective I've given tonight, it didn't come from anywhere else, yeah. right? It didn't come in, you know, didn't come in a spaceship, right? It wasn't. It wasn't handed down to us on a pair of stone templates, right? It, it, you know, we we. It's this one process that 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 has that has produced us. That we're you know all of us here, and you know it, every every human every human society that we know of have any evidence of spirituality has emerged in that society. In there's been some form or, of expression of it so i think i see spirituality as being fundamental to to our species and and that invariably leads to kind of ethical reflection and and thinking about which means you know by definition we're thinking about some one and things other than ourselves and hence the concept of responsibility so i you know it it's um i i i'm, I'm agreeing with the, the comments and Ian that it's 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 um I well the comment was can it be merged with modern science? I would argue that modern science supports the notion that it's fundamental to who and what we are. Mm, yeah. Lovely. And um, there's a know, sense in which yeah. uh, Eastern religions are more sensitive to the notion of interconnectedness than than our Western religion uh, actually teaches us. You know, I was formally taught that um, uh, we have dominion over the the fishes of the water and the birds of the air that they're, they're here as our playthings and our resources. And uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see a spirituality that embraces the interconnectedness of life and our critical dependence on life rather than the presumption that we are somehow superior to all other species and uh, they're just here for us to play with. Absolutely. And that, again, is the essence of the work we do in AILA. And um, just a sidestep, I've put a link in. If you go to our Green Prince website and scroll down, there's a one-hour public lecture by Mary Graham, um, a remarkable Indigenous elder and thinker. And she, I'm honoured to be working on a book with her about the relationist ethos. And she refers to the fundamental governance system that our Aboriginal peoples created as a sacralised ecological custodianship of country based on autonomous or semi-autonomous bioregionally based, you know, entities, uh, mm -hmm. countries, whatever modern uh, English words we'd use. And I do believe it offers a profound insight into what the future for Australia should be if we want to survive the next couple of hundred years as a species. But um, just one last question, and then we might start to wrap up. Um, 
Sue Reed, um, lovely to see Sue on here too, um, has asked, uh, well said, marine scientists are having a hard time being listened to by the International Seabed Authority. Um, their warnings about ecological damage from seabed mining are being at best cherry picked and at worst ignored. How can we build political clout and is the notion of scientific neutrality no longer serving us well? Well, I, I don't think we can ever pretend to be objective. Um, one of the points of sustainability science is that um, uh, we, we are not um, like spectators at a football match observing what's going on and in principle objective, although if you talk to spectators of a football match, they're inevitably influenced by what they want to see rather than what actually happens. But we're actually out on the field, face down in the mud. You know, we're part of the natural systems. So we can't objectively observe something of which we are an integral part so i think we need to recognize that you know we have an we have skin in the game you know we uh, we have a vested interest in survival and we can't pretend to be objective and i think it's really important for scientists to understand the damage we're doing to natural systems and the perilous path that we're embarked on to be speaking up about it i mean uh, basically I've spent a lot of time and energy in the last 40 years trying to persuade decision makers to worry about the consequences of our action. And we're seeing uh, some change. I mean, I think politicians respond when the community responds. And I think we saw at the last election um, that uh, the community now recognises that climate change is a problem and wants to see something done about it. Uh, you know, our role, I think, as scientists to understand the seriousness of the problems is to keep communicating that. Uh, I even wrote a piece that was published in the Saturday paper this weekend, pointing out the, the consequences of the State of the Environment report and the need to, for decision makers to take on board the fact that uh, we exist within natural systems and we need to maintain them at our peril. Uh, Thank you, Ian. Brendan? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just like to say that you know, what I'm calling the modern quantitative scientific method. I see I'm frozen, a bit, frozen again, but you can hear me okay, is that yes, right? Yes, we can hear you, Brendan. Okay. You know, the modern quantitative scientific method is really useful. I mean, we, you know, we're all talking here today because of it, or sorry, because of the technological applications of it. I mean, and that's the, you know, that's one of the purposes of the scientific, modern scientific quantitative method is it can produce useful stuff. But the problem is, you know, you had your um, nested systems diagram, Ian, right? Well, yeah. technology is one of the, you know, it's one of the inner, it's a circle in there, but, it, but it's only, it's only, it's useful and not harmful if it's, if it's given the right context and given the right direction and, and, and it's applied to the right mission and purpose. And, it, and at the moment, most of it's being applied just to make money at the expense of everything you know of value that we care about so you know it, 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 you know we do have to recognize the benefits of technology when it's when it's properly directed and is, and, it, and is given a given a, a moral purpose i guess mm. but you know this idea that we can just have technical innovation you know outside of its societal and and and, and, and environmental consequences i mean it's a very it's a very dangerous it's a very dangerous thing we're we're allowed to happen but i'm not I'm not at all, you know, anti-scientific knowledge. No, no. It's, very, it's very important, and and you know, modern, you know, technology of any kind, you know, uh, can really help our lives, but can help us deal with these terrible challenges, but not not unrestrained, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, the kind of system we have at the moment. How how, how we rein it back in? How we rein back back this science technology? Um, you know, corporate complex into something that's serving humans and nature is 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 a huge challenge. Yeah, slowing what one of my reverend colleagues called the onward march to the gold-plated arse fiver. <laughs> Sad and scary. Yeah. Um, look, I realise we're coming up. Well, we've just passed eight o'clock, so we'll definitely start wrapping up. I could see. I think. Um, I think Brendan may have frozen, but if he can still hear us, then I'm sure we can still hear him. What I would like to do is give
give a huge thank you to Brendan and Ian for sharing your Monday evening with us and sharing this important information. Um, I'm really pleased that we'll be able to share this recording on our website so that others can uh, engage with these beautiful notions of interconnectedness. I would also um, like to thank all of you for sharing your Monday night with us. Uh, and just give a quick plug, if you'd like to join the rest of Earth Laws Month, please look us up, earthlaws.org.au backslash ELM 2022. And also, if you um, go to our homepage, you'll see a link to the whole program. Um, I also want to start mentioning, and I've been whacked over the head by many in my team to remind folks, we've just started a new program called Friends of Ayla. Um, and we're trying to invite wonderful human beings to connect with us and to be regular supporters of our work, to tune in to lovely updates and special reports, um, and also perhaps to, to donate a little bit each month if you're in any ability to do so. We're trying to grow the next generation of Earth Laws uh, coordinators and people, uh, and there ain't a lot of money out there. So we're starting to invite people to think about five, 10, 15, 20 bucks a month, $2 a month, anything at all. And we're trying to get 100 good people to share so that we can support the work we do. But we can tell you more about that. I really hate doing an advert at the end of such a beautiful talk. But to support Ayla, um, yeah, do have a look at all of our work and stay in touch. But on that note, Brendan, Ian, any final words on um, interconnectivity? Just I think we should thank you for the, the wonderful initiative of Earth Laws Month and you bringing together these events and uh, yeah, well, uh, thank allowing, you. allowing us to share our thoughts with the wider community. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. And Brendan, an, a good night from you. Yeah, well, thanks, everyone. It's great to have such a good turn up and uh, I hope we've given everyone something to think about. Yes, go forth and hug your bowl of rice. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. Really appreciate your time. We'll see you soon. Thank you, lovelies.